Hello readers, uh, this is the video that goes with the Q&A for painting armor. And I believe it says painting armor on a knight, and it does not specify if the knight is a dog or not, but it is in this case. Uh, and you can see, so getting started I've got a few layers already set up. Um, there is a sketch layer where I've figured out the design for the most part of the armor already. And there is a color study on the top that is obviously me figuring out the colors beforehand. Um, as far as how I come up with it, I mean that's just, that's composition. I mean it depends on whatever you want to do. I wanted something that felt like uh, uh, kind of an old Renaissance royalty portrait. Um, so it's, you know, it's a lot of browns and reds. And I just played around with different combinations until something started to feel right and then again because you're not concerned with how well you're drawing it or whether or not you know the proportions are great or the perspective is great you're just trying to see if the colors feel right next to each other and theoretically I mean with something like Photoshop where you can just use any color whenever you want indefinitely you can really just mess around with it until it starts to feel right and in this case once the um, once the light that was falling on, because I'll, I'll usually do the shadows first and then I put the light on top of it. Once the light starts to feel natural, um, I'll key everything to one object. So in this case, I think it was the, um, the doggy bed, the little red doggy bed. Um, once the light falling on that felt right, I paint everything else trying to get the color to match and feel like it's in the same room with that doggy bed. If your illustration does not have a doggy bed, I don't know what to tell you. Probably start over with a doggy bed. So here I'm putting in the first flats for the armor. And a lot of times normally I'll put down a darker uh, flat for the beginning. But since armor is, specifically this armor that I'm doing right now, um, is so reflective. Like it's, gonna, it's not quite a mirror finish, but it's getting there. Um, because it's so reflective, I'm using a higher value. Because I know that it's not, it's not going to be in shadow the same way um, her fur is and her, and her paws are and stuff. The way that light hits matte forms or dull forms or, you know, furry forms or whatnot um, is kind of, it's very easy to predict. It's just wherever the light source is, you draw arrows coming out of it and, I mean, you 3D arrows coming out and wherever they would hit, light is, and wherever they don't hit, there's no light. But Anything reflective is a lot trickier because you're thinking more about the idea of these mirrors kind of bending all over the form of whatever you're painting. That being said, though, you can get away with a lot of um, sort of abstract design in the, the light and shadow on the armor that you wouldn't normally be able to play around with uh, on something dull like cotton. It's always good to put straps in with armor and stuff like that. Just things to kind of uh, 
let the viewer see um, how the clothing or whatever the item is that's in the picture, how, can, so they can understand how it works. One of the benefits of taking the time to do a tight drawing before you're painting um, is that you can actually use a drawing in the painting as long as you lock the layer towards the I mean, technically you can do whatever you want with the drawing, but what I usually do is I lock the layer towards the end at some point and I just paint in um, not necessarily darker values, but usually darker values um, from whatever the surface area around there is. So like say on uh, my dog's cheek there, she's got fairly like dark brown fur all over and where the shadows are, instead of leaving the black of the sketch because it looks, it looks so unnatural, um, using kind of like a, a deeper, more of a kind of a burgundy, like a dark burgundy and locking the layer and painting that into all of the shadows where there are sketch lines and it kind of it just it saves you the sketch of putting in a lot of the dark darks that normally I would do like three quarters into the painting As you, <coughs> I'm sorry. As you can see, I'm going back to reference that color study a lot. And while I still, I pretty much always like to experiment while I'm working. Um, I have run into a lot of problems when I decide I'm going to move away from my color study and do some some new interesting thing that I've come up with, and often I'll get several hours into it and realize I should have just stuck with the color study. <laughs> 
I've seen a few artists before who um, they will paint areas close to finish and then move on to another area and build up another one close to a finish and then move into another area and they're slowly kind of like wiping across from one end to the other uh, with a finished painting. But I like to do passes over the whole thing in smaller increments. So like here when I'm doing the flats, I'll do most all the flats in the whole thing. Like I've, I've, I've done the trim on the armor and the armor and the dog and the, the bed. And then I go back to the bed and start putting in the light and I'll start putting in the light on each of the objects but I won't take them too far so that when I get to the end of each pass it gives me a chance to look at the painting and make sure I'm not kind of moving in a direction that I'm going to regret in a few hours. It seems like it's usually in some kind of in, in the throes of like a 3 a.m. passion when I'm not stopping to check what I'm doing too much, that I will work on an area and take it way too far and realize that either the reflections, like the colors in the reflections don't feel right, or maybe the, the contrast is too intense in the area that I've been working in, but that because I'm not taking moments to step back and look at what I've done, I, I'll, t I'll take an area too far. It's a good idea. It's a sorry. It's a good idea. Oh, it is a good idea too when you're working on armor to work up the color in the areas around it first, because all of the highlights and shadows are going to be based on the environment around the armor. So you need to know all the colors in the room before you start painting it. 
trim like this is nice on armor because it can be a good way to break up the fact that it's all one color. Especially with something like this where I have a lot of large shapes that are also uh, monochromatic, like the, the dog bed is all red, and the room itself is pretty dark, and uh, the Greyhound is all one color. So it helps to use the armor to kind of break things up. As far as where I got the design of the yellow and the black, I looked at a lot of old suits of armor from uh, European museums, and obviously online. <laughs> I didn't fly over there for it, but um, if you if you just look at, especially um, if it's something that did exist in real life, like armor, where we have a ton of history of cultures who have designed armor already, um, it's a good idea to look at as much of it as you can and. Just pick the things that you like and base your design over the things that uh, get a rise out of you. And I really liked when they used the black and gold trim on. And there were a few suits of armor that I saw that had it, and it always felt really nice. Also, I looked at a lot of horse armor. Partially because my dog looks like a very small horse. All right, so I'm starting to place the highlights now. And so trying to figure out where those highlights are is, and I mentioned it in the Q&A, but it basically it's like 
if you know which you, you need to <laughs> if you know where the light sources are what you're trying to figure out is at what angle so if you pointed a laser at the armor at what angle would you have to point the laser so that it would, when it bounced off uh, it would bounce and hit the light source and remember it's going to bounce off at the same angle you hit the armor at um, and then depending on how it's curving it's also it's going to shoot it off in a different direction so imagining that laser that's where you're placing the the highest values and actually I mean the dark values too because if you were to say point this imaginary laser and it hit uh, a cabinet that was totally in shadow and that whole area of the room was really dark that would show up as a, a shadow in, and if it had a hard edge it would show up as a hard shadow that would just run across the armor wherever that laser again is bouncing off and hitting that area of the room And obviously when you're painting something like, well I don't know if it's obvious, but when you're painting something like this doggy bed, because it's not reflective, the laser thing has nothing to do with where the light is. Um, where things are bouncing off, it's very, it's, it has a very small effect. For the most part, what you're seeing is everything that is facing the light source. And the more it faces away from the light source, the less light it has on it which again it's different from armor because or at least reflective armor because even if the surface of the armor is turning away from the light source if the direction it's turning away is that middle angle between you and where the light's coming from that's going to be the highlight that's going to be the brightest part it's not the part that's facing the light source it's the part that is between the two <laughs> 
normally when you would paint an object, uh, the transition from light to shadow is somewhat predictable. But when you're working on armor at 10, it'll just go back and forth between uh, a really bright highlight and then there'll be a really dark shadow. And then you might see more of um, the local color, of whatever local color there is to the armor. And then it'll jump back to a really bright highlight and then another really dark shadow. Um, but that, that mixture of seeing bright highlights next to dark shadows is part of what makes things look like metal. It also helps to, because I would like to point out now that I've been painting it for a while, um, it helps to have the highlights and the shadows on separate layers because that way you can mess with the brightness and the contrast of each one individually. Also, don't, there's no need to take the highlights and the shadows at this point all the way to the edge of the range. Um, usually it's not until the end of the painting that I'll add in uh, anything near white or black. You'll notice here I'm putting a lot of highlights into um, places where there are seams on the armor because anytime there's an edge or a part of the metal that bends, it's really prone to picking up light. And having those shiny edges is again one of those things that helps define uh, to the brain that what it's looking at is reflective. 
you may notice I haven't started um, working the highlights and the shadows into the trim, like the gold parts yet. Um, but once uh, all the silver parts of the armor are figured out, it makes the trim a lot easier. So I just focus on getting a specific section of it finished and figuring out what highlights and shadows feel like they're they're working with the light source. And then once that's done, I move on to the gold. If your armor feels dull, uh, and I'm obviously I mean uh, not reflective dull and not boring dull, but if it feels dull, uh, that usually means you either need to brighten your highlights and or darken your shadows. Because the more reflective it is, the higher the range of values are. It's important to have the trim on a separate layer as well because it makes it much easier to put in the highlights when you can either A, lock the layer and paint on it, or B, create a clipping mask over it. And when you're using a clipping mask, um, nothing that you paint is going to go outside the borders of whatever is on the layer below it. 
that gold trim on the doggy bed is actually kind of a good example of something in between the dullness of the suede on the doggy bed and the shininess of the metal armor because even though it's not as reflective as a mirror the fact that it's kind of, it's it's a slightly reflective gold you know i don't know if it's satin but it's slightly reflective um it picks up highlights and it has a higher value range than the doggy bed does because it is it's slightly shiny Alright, so now that I have the design of the light and shadows down in a way that I like, I'm going to go in and start painting in those bright highlights. And it's as you're doing that, that's when it really starts to feel how reflective the armor is decided at this point. And again, it's a good time to go over the edges and kind of pop those highlights in places where you want to define uh, how the metal how the metal is bending and connecting. Actually, it's interesting. Um, so in the same way that because something like uh, her matte fur is going to pick up light very different from how the reflective armor does, when you are painting eyes on a character, because the, the cornea is reflective and kind of wet, um, it may have highlights on it even when a face is in shadow. Um, if the light is far enough away or is at a weird angle so that it is not actually falling on the form it's the eyes may still be in a position where they're going to reflect that light source back to the viewer so just because eyes are in shadow don't assume that it, they don't have highlights on them 
Now I'm using the blending tool to soften the edges of some of those highlights. And what I'm softening basically just is so that no specific area that I don't want to draw attention to isn't going to get a ton of attention. Because if you have sharp lines and a lot of contrast, it is going to become a focal point whether you like it or not. It's worth noting too that when metal when metal bends, uh, it tends to pick up highlights that run along the bend. So let's say that you had uh, some kind of ankle gear on, right, and it's bending around the fronts of your ankles. Highlights are going to run up and down where uh, where your shin where your shin bone is and they're going to be much less likely to be horizontal. They can still technically be horizontal, like if there was a, if there was a horizon, say, behind the camera, and it's sunset and there's a, a bright uh, stripe of light, it's still possible that because it's so long, it's going to bend around the shin, and you could get a horizontal, uh, you could get a horizontal highlight, but for the most part, everything it's picking up, it's going to naturally want to have running vertical. So unless you have a really good reason to have that highlight go against the bend, it should be moving with the bend. When you have round surfaces um, on armor, like especially things like this, where you have those little studs that are connecting things, um, the highlights will generally hit the surface on all of them in the same place. Because when you have spheres, uh, the light source is going to be reflected in generally the same spot, as long as the spheres aren't in a very different spot. Like so, let's say that she had some of those studs on the back end, which we can't see in the video right now, but 
just assume that she had some of those studs on the back end like she has here on the pauldron. Those highlights because the, the light source is still going to be at the same angle between you and them. Those highlights are going to show up in the same spot. But if it was facing in a different direction and it was, it was in on the other side of the room, um, if it's not in the same, if, if that roundness isn't to the same degree or if it's facing in a different direction, it's going to either not pick up that highlight or it's going to show it in a different spot. 
Okay, so I've skipped ahead, and apparently I don't work on the armor anymore for the rest of the video. I thought maybe I was going to go back in and do something else to it, or maybe something with the highlights, but I guess I am done with it, so I will sign off myself here. Um, hopefully that guy is, uh, oh, sorry, hopefully that helped uh, illuminate how to paint armor a little bit for you guys. Um, it's always, it's tricky, and as always, I would suggest you get reference. That's always the best thing to do, and it's uh, it's really hard to imagine all those light sources off the top of your head. So I suggest even if you can't get perfect reference of a person in armor, at least get some metallic or shiny things and set them up in such a way that they are going to mimic the lighting of the scene that you're painting. And once you've got that kind of information and you've painted it a few times, it'll be a little bit easier to, uh, to guess where stuff's going to fall. But again, for the most part, start with reference and use it until uh, it's not it's not as imperative for you when you're trying to figure out how to simulate that feeling. 